come to order, remain seated. Myself and another agent helped type me out, type it out, and then I present to the judge, swore it, and offered oral testimony and then signed it. What assistance did the other agent give you in the writing of the affidavit? I think help pulling up the form. Just and, the form? Yes, sir. On a computer? Yes, sir. All right. So it was just the two of you when you wrote it? If I recall correctly, there was a room full of agents who were using that command post, but um, and he may have actually typed what I told him to type with it. I do not recall. But it is my affidavit and my word. Good. Uh, where did you do that? Where did you prepare? Here in Glenn County at a uh, office we were using with the Department of Natural Resources. Now, before you wrote your affidavit, did you consult with any district attorney or any lawyer? I did, yes. Sir. Which one? Tom Durden. And did you and Mr. Durden discuss the content of the charge you would put in each of these two affidavits? Yes, sir, we did. Did he help you with the wording you selected? No, sir. Um, I prepared the warrants. I called him, read to him what I had put in there to make sure that he saw no error in the wording, and he did not. And at that point, I went and presented to the judge. All right, so you wrote them. You checked with uh, D.A. Durden. He said, sounds good, and then you went to see Judge Harris. That's correct, yes, sir. And you went to see Judge Harrison where? Here in Glen County. Um, I believe he's at his residence. And you remember what time of day it was? It was um, towards the evening, sir. I don't remember the exact time. So the warrants all begin the same. Yours begins personally came and then it has your name. Who on oath says? And Judge Harrison put you under oath, I presume? He did, sir. And then he stood there or sat there at his residence with you and read the affidavit? He did, and then I or I gave oral testimony concerning the facts. Well, let me talk case. about that now. When you say you gave him a oral testimony, um, that's testimony that's not contained in the affidavit that I'm looking at? That's correct, yes. Uh, what did you tell Judge Harrison that's not contained in this affidavit? I presented to him the facts that we had uncovered during the investigation. How long did it take you to do that? I don't recall an exact time frame. Well, let's just guess. Guessing's okay. You just gave the facts of the case or much of them in about two or three hours of testimony. Were you at Judge Harrison's house for two or three hours? I was not, no sir. Were you at his house for two or three minutes? Yes sir, more than that. About two or three minutes? No sir, more than that. How many more minutes than that? I don't know. Approximately? I don't want to approximate. I can tell you it's more than two or three minutes, but I don't want to approximate further well, than that. Well, let's narrow it down then. Were you at Judge Harrison's house more than 30 minutes? I don't know. Were you there more than an hour? I don't believe so, no sir. So you were there under an hour? Yes sir. Did you and Judge Harrison stand or sit? 
I believe I was standing, Judge Harrison was sitting, if I recall correctly. So you were inside his house? I was, yes, sir. All right, so you stood, he sat, and then you told him something that's not contained in this affidavit. I gave him oral testimony on the facts of the case. That's correct, yes, sir. All I'm trying to get from you, Agent Dial, is how in depth did you go with him that's not containing this affidavit? I presented him the facts in as concise and as full as I was able at that point in the investigation, the facts that I had available to me. And you were able to do that from memory? You didn't have your case file with you and read anything to him? No, that's correct. I was able to do it from memory. And the best your memory serves you today, it was some time less than an hour, but you can't get any more precise than that? I don't want to be more precise than that, no, sir, because I don't want to be in error. I know it was less than an hour. I know it was more than two to three minutes. Anything else would be total guessing in my part. Let me assure you of something. You can't get dinged ever anywhere in this case if it turns out that you guess X minutes and say Judge Harrison was to come and testify at some later hearing and say, no, it was Y minutes. That's not going to happen. I'm just trying to get an idea from you how in depth you went with him that's not containing the only thing I get to look at, which is this affidavit. That's all I'm trying to get. I understand, sir. Can you give it to me? Less than an hour, more than two to three minutes. I think that's his answer. All right. But whatever you said to him for however long it took, it was substantive. It was facts about the case. Yes, sir. That's correct. In support of the warrant. That's correct. Yes, sir. Okay. So did you do that because Judge Harrison said, this isn't enough, Agent Dial. I need more. No, sir. So why did you do it? Because that's what I normally do in investigations when I present a warrant to a judge. This is a normal warrant form that we utilize. I present it to a judge. I offer oral testimony towards the probable cause of the case. A judge rules whether or not I have enough probable cause. If he finds I do, he signs the warrant authorizing the arrest. That is the normal procedure that I follow in my investigation and have for the past 19 years. Was Judge Harrison taking notes? I don't believe so, no, sir. Were you recording it? I was not, no, sir. Was he? Not that I'm aware of, no, sir. Did you take any notes of what you told him either contemporaneously or later? I believe the only thing I documented or have dictated to be documented was the fact that I sought the warrants and offered oral testimony, if I recall correctly, but not any further detail than that. Is it your testimony today, then, that that further detail you gave Judge Harrison is lost to your memory? You couldn't repeat it? I offered him the facts in reference to this case. I cannot repeat word for word specifically what I told him, no, sir. Okay. I would understand you couldn't do that. Give me generally what you told him. I advised him what I had discovered in the review of the Glynn County Police Department case file. I offered testimony concerning the fact that we had uncovered witnesses that had seen him jogging, that Mr. English had made the statement to one of my agents that there had not been a theft from the residence during the February 11th or that day. Those are the particular aspects that I remember right now. Yes, sir. I think that's pretty much it. Is that close? That's all I can remember right now. Yes, sir. All right. But you'd say that's pretty close to what you told Judge Harrison? I know I provided that information. That's the best of my recollection at this point. We went over the video, offered to show him the video. I described what the video showed. I went into their statements that they provided to the Glynn County Police Department. That was the substance of my oral testimony to him. You didn't show him the video? I did not. I asked if he wished to, and he did not. I did describe it to him. All right. So what you just told me in recounting what you told Judge Harrison took maybe a couple of minutes. I went into detail with him. With you, I just talked about the topics. With him, I went into detail. Okay. Now, in the warrant you wrote, if you now even have a copy of it, the one charging Greg McMichael with aggravated assault, you chose to charge him as a party to aggravated assault 
when you cite the statute, OCGA section 16521, uh, did you have to look up that statute to get the number right? Or do you know that? I, that statute, I believe I had to look up to find 16521. And you wrote party to that crime. Did you look up OCGA 16220, the party to a crime statute? I don't recall if I looked that up or not because I did not reference the actual OCGA number in the warrant for party to the crime. But you're familiar with that statute? Yes, sir. I've charged people with party to the crime. All right. You're familiar enough with it to know that it has several different ways in which a person can be a party to a crime? Yes, sir. And under 16220B3, the statute says intentionally aids or abets in the commission of the crime, and that's the one you chose. Right? Yes, sir. Because later on in the warrant, you use those words aided and abetted. Yes, sir. Are you a lawyer? No, sir. I'm a police officer. Well, I understand, but I know police officers who also are lawyers. Right? I am not, no, sir. You never went to law school? I did not, no, sir. Your legal training comes from continuing education as a law enforcement officer? On the laws of the state Yes, sir. Of that's correct. All right. So from time to time, you have education settings, seminars, or what have you, where this law, party to a crime, might be discussed. It might be. I don't recall if it was specifically discussed in the training that I've had. Well, since you chose aiding and abetting, you know what those words mean? I do, yes, sir. What, what do they mean? Assisting someone. Assisting? Yes, sir. That's my definition of it. Does aiding and abetting mean the same thing? Both words? To my parlance, yes. And that's okay. I, mm -hmm. This isn't a trick question. I'm not. I understand. It sounds like a trick it question. It does. <laughs> it's not. I assure you, it's not. I'm trying to figure out what you mean in your warrant. You say essentially aiding and abetting mean assisting. <laughs> so, you, to use regular words and not legal terms, you charge Greg McMichael with assisting, and I'll read it, Travis McMichael when he, Travis, pointed and discharged a shotgun, which is a deadly weapon capable of causing death or serious bodily injury at a Mon Arbor. That's what that one says, right? Yes, sir. So it's assisting Travis in the pointing and the discharging of a shotgun. Now, At Mr. Aubrey, yes, sir. Correct. Now tell us what Greg McMichael did to assist Travis in the pointing and discharging of a shotgun. Judge, at this point, considering the totality of what's been presented to this court, I think this line of question has been asked and answered. And how's that last phrase? What did you say? Asked and answered. Asked and answered? Yes, sir. I think it's been covered in the totality of the hearing that we've been a part of today, that this topic has been asked and answered. I'll let you continue, but let's, let's, get, let's get through with it. I, I, I don't plan to be up here very long at all. And I do agree that much of this has already been asked and answered, but not this question. All right. I want to know what Greg McMichael did to assist his son Travis in the pointing and discharging of a shotgun. Initially, it was Greg McMichael that advised his son that Ahmad Aubrey was running down the road. Greg McMichael armed himself as well as Travis armed himself. They both entered the vehicle. When um, they caught up Mr. Aubrey, Mr. Aubrey turned and went back up Buford, or Burford, I'm sorry. Greg McMichael exited the vehicle approach him, saw that he was going back up Burford, went back to Travis McMichael and said, come on, back the car up, you know, let's go. Otherwise, encouraging him to box him in, pointing his direction out. That's when Travis said, no, let's circle around. When they circled around, Greg McMichael is in the back of the truck on 911. You hear him say, stop, stop, and then him yell, Travis, on the 911 call. To me, that is assisting Travis first. He is the first one that initiates the entire event <clears throat> that, that accumulated in the death of Mott Aubrey. 
Second, while I put aided, embedded, assisted, however you want to phrase it, he's encouraging the continued pursuit and the final confrontation with Ahmaud Aubrey. And then while he's on 911 call, he alerts Travis of Ahmaud Aubrey's approach along the passenger side of the vehicle. Okay, I got all that. You're not saying, though, are you, Agent Dial, that when Greg McMichael did all of those things you just described leading up to the shooting, that he did all of those things to assist Travis McMichael, knowing that he was going to point and discharge his shotgun during all of that time that you just described? You're not saying that. I, I, am, I am saying that Greg McMichael knew that Travis McMichael had a shotgun. I do not believe that Greg McMichael thought that Travis McMichael had a shotgun for decorative purposes or that he had it for the purposes that he may use it. And that's what Greg McMichael knew when he engaged in those acts. Do you take the position that he knew that Travis McMichael would indeed point and discharge that firearm that day when he did all those previous things? I, I think he knew it would be a distinct possibility. Otherwise, why would Travis McMichael have the shotgun when he gets in the car? Okay. I think it's a foreseeable consequence of what happened. All right. Now, earlier in your testimony, you attributed to Greg McMichael the words that he said to Travis McMichael, don't shoot. That's what Greg McMichael told the first responding officers he said. However, the 911 call which recorded his statement at shooting does not reflect that. I think what, Cap, what Greg McMichael told the first responding officer is what Greg McMichael had going through his mind. However, he did not, I do not believe he actually said those words. But I think at that point, he knew that Travis McMichael was fixing to fire the shotgun and kill Ahmaud Aubrey. And so you think Greg McMichael had in his mind at that moment the oh, words, don't shoot? I think he was hoping that Travis would not shoot at that moment, yes, sir. All right. When you uh, executed a search warrant for the McMichael house just recently, you did that looking for, what, anything that would, would assist and support the warrant for helping Travis McMichael point and discharge a shotgun? I was looking for evidence relating to the death of Mud Aubrey, which includes um, murder, which is listed on the warrant. I was searching for Greg McMichael's cell phone at that point as well as electronic devices which may have information, video, pictures in reference to the shooting incident. And specifically with respect to Greg McMichael, you were looking for anything that would be evidence to support warrant that he assisted his son in the crimes of aggravated assault and felony murder, right? Well, the facts concerning what happened that day. <clears throat> I, I didn't go in there <clears throat> attempting to uh, do a search warrant attempting to support one more or another. I'm there to collect facts and evidence in the case of what happened. Did you collect any evidence from the search warrant of the McMichael House that would assist this court in determining probable cause with the charges in these warrants of assisting Travis McMichael in these two crimes? Again, we see several electronic devices. Those have not been um, downloaded as of yet because there was concern involving privileged information on them. They are in the hands of the techs. So I do not have that information available. However, we were able to examine the router that the um, was located at the residence. That's the Wi-Fi router, mm -hmm. specifically a specific designation or name. And again, I am not a technical person, so I am relying upon my agents who are to that um, an examination of Travis McMichael's cell phone that was downloaded by Glen County PD on the day of the murder had revealed that shortly before the incident took place that his cell phone was connected to a Wi-Fi router. Um, at this point we were able to determine that the Wi-Fi router he was connected was the one at the house. So we can confirm Greg McMichael and Travis McMichael's statement that there is actual evidence that he was at the house prior to the pursuit of Ahmaud Aubrey. If that answers your question, sir. I think it does. Let me say it back to you, make sure I did understand it. So the electronic devices you seized from the McMichael house, among which includes a router, have established for you that Travis McMichael was indeed in the house 
just prior to leaving the house for the events that unfolded that you testified to your point this morning. Yes, sir. That's that's what we have established so far. But my hope is that when the examination of the electronics is complete, it could help us again uh, with more information. And you did not get Greg McMichael's phone in that search, right? I did not, no, sir. You got that a little later. I did, sir. Yes. Sir. <clears throat> Pursue it to another search form. That's correct, yes, sir. And have you been able to extract the, all the data from his phone? No, sir. Again, at this point, it's in the hand of my technicians. I've told them to download it but not review it, pending. My understanding from the district attorney's office that there may be privileged information on it and that that's something that would be addressed to the court before we examine that information. So for purposes of today's hearing then, you can state that there is no evidence from any of the electronic devices connected to Greg McMichael that supports the warrants for I, today's purposes. I can't say, I haven't looked, those information hasn't been announced, so I can't say it's there. I'm saying I do not have access to information from those electronic devices, I think would be the proper way to put that. Well, well, I think we're agreeing. I mean, essentially, you don't have any evidence to offer today in support of the warrant that comes from Greg McMichael's phone. Oh, that's, well, because, I, yes, sir, I don't have any information from his phone as of yet. Let me talk to you about the interview or interviews of Greg McMichael. <clears throat> now, you mentioned that at least one interview conducted by Glenn County Police Department. That yes, you're aware of, right? Well, yes, one was done at the Glenn County Police Department by a detective. One was done on scene by one of their first responding officers. And the one on scene, let's talk about that one first. Was it on a body cam? It was, yes, sir. So it's recorded video and audio. Yes, sir. Do you remember that officer's name? I do not remember that officer's name. Um, he did a report, I believe it, I, I do not recall his name. You, you reviewed that body cam video? I, I did, yes, sir. About how long, again, I know, not pinning you down to yes. Yeah, well, the, there's body cameras from the entire event that he's out there, so it's not just the video of Greg Michael, it's from the time he's there until he leaves. So I don't know how long the entire camera is or how long specifically the interview with Greg Michael was. Well, part of that whatever length of body cam footage we're talking about, part of it included that officer talking directly to Greg McMichael. Yes, sir, that's correct. Standing outside in the, in the street, I guess? Yes, sir, by the truck, beside Travis McMichael's truck. And no just guess as to how long that interview was? I, I wouldn't hazard a guess, sir. No. How about tell us what he said during that interview? Again, you're not quoting, I know, unless you have your case filed again. I don't. Um, the best of my recollection, it is, like I said, at that point where Greg McMichael explains that he was in the back of the truck, um, that the guy came um, running towards Travis. He says there's two shots. Um, at that point, he says that Travis had no choice um, but to shoot him. Greg says that um, he was pulling his gun, um, that he would have shot him if he'd got the gun away from Travis, I believe is... And that's a rough summation of his first statement. At the Let me same. make sure I understand that last part. Greg says that he, Greg, would have shot Ahmad Arbery had Ahmad Arbery gotten Travis's shotgun away <coughs> from Travis. That's correct, yes, sir. Now, the uh, interview, I guess, happened at the police department? Yes, sir. That's correct. Later? Yes, sir. Later that same day? That same day, yes, sir. Um, as far as you know, Greg McMichael voluntarily gave that statement. Yes, sir, he did. He was, he was not in custody. He was not in custody, no, sir. And not to my understanding. That statement is on video? It is, audio and video. And you've watched it? I have, yes, sir. Can you estimate about how long that one is? I, I, I wouldn't feel proper to estimate it. I would, 30 minutes maybe, a little okay. over. Fair enough. I'm not going to hold you to any minutes here. Um, now, that sounds like it's longer than whatever he did on the body cam, though, right? It is very much so, sir. Was he consistent in what he said during that 30 minute, and I'll just call it 30 minutes, knowing it might be more or less, that interview, was that consistent with what he said on the body cam at the scene? It was, with the exception on the scene, he made the statement that he was yelling, 
Travis, don't don't shoot him. Where when we went at the Glen County Police Department, he did not make that, that make the statement that he had said those words. Other than that, yes, I believe it was consistent. Tell us anything he said during that thirty minute at the police station interview that would show that he knew that he was assisting or aiding and abetting intending to aid him that Travis McMichael in the pointing and discharging of a shotgun at a Mont Arbor. Judge, I will object to ask and answered. Well, I'm talking about an interview for the very first time. You may go ahead. All right. You, you may answer. He outlined the facts that I presented earlier, that he was working in the front yard, saw Mont Aubrey run by, <clears throat> went into the house, told Travis McMichael, that that was him. They both grabbed guns. They got in the vehicle. They pursued Ahmad Aubrey. Again, he indicated he exited the vehicle, um, tried to encourage Travis McMichael to go back um, and engage Ahmad <coughs> Aubrey. Travis McMichael said, no, get in. We're going to circle around. They circled around. Um, he indicated that um, he was in the back of the truck at that point, that um, he saw Ahmad Aubrey come running at Travis. He says two shots. He's Consistent on that during both statements. Um, and, and he's obviously wrong about that, right? He is, yes, sir. But you don't think he was lying? He was just wrong? I, I do not think he was lying. I think he was just wrong. I don't, my opinion is he did not <clears throat> register the first shot that occurred. Fair enough. Now, so far as you know, has Greg McMichael been interviewed by any other law enforcement agent, agent or agency? after that interview that you just recounted that was that very day. He had conversations with law enforcement officers. I do not think he has been interviewed by anybody other than Glen County Police Department. But these other conversations then you're aware of them? Some of them, yes. Sir. And you're aware of them how? I've inter I've interviewed or attempted to interview people that had the conversations with him. Um, and these are law enforcement officers? Yes, sir. Um, one is a Glen County Police Department officer, and then I believe Greg McMichael had contacted the current investigator with the district attorney's office, and I believe he actually spoke with the district attorney. I do not know the substance of all those conversations, but he did speak with them. So uh, you said you interviewed some or all three of those people? You just some of those, not, not all of them. Which, which ones did you interview? I've interviewed Bill Darris, which is the investigator with the district attorney's office, and I've interviewed the Glen County Police Department officer. I had a conversation with Greg McMichael. And just generally, what did those two officers tell you Greg McMichael said about the event? And in particular, I'm looking for, did he say anything different, inconsistent? No, sir, I don't believe he said anything different than what he said in the interview. So whatever he said to them, and we don't need to go over it, is consistent with what he said on the body cam and in the interview. Yes, sir. That's correct. All right. <clears throat> Are you aware of any others besides the ones you just met that he's you call I, I used the word interviewed. Those were not really formal interviews, were they? No, sir. They were conversations. just conversation statements about the event. Did, did uh, those people write reports of what he said? Did they mm -hmm. record it in any way? No, sir. So any others that you know of? No, sir. Okay, earlier in your testimony today, you talked about comments Greg McMichael made on Facebook that are related to these warrants. Can you generally sum those up? The one I was told about was after the shooting on the day of the incident, Greg McMichael posted something on Facebook that Travis McMichael had been involved in a shooting. It was at this point that uh, a Glen County PD officer sent a Facebook instant message to Greg McMichael saying, hey, call me, and provided his phone number. And that's when Greg McMichael called him. Um, the officer in question did not know that Greg McMichael was directly involved in the incident at the time that he sent the message. Um, he, This officer was a friend of Travis, and he was concerned when he saw it on Facebook. you remember that officer's name? Officer Cooper, I believe, sir. And did Officer Cooper and Greg McMichael then have a phone conversation? They did, yes, sir. Has Officer Cooper told you what Greg McMichael 
said to him on the phone. He has. And generally, what was that? That, um, I, generally it was similar to what he has statements that are already given. I don't remember. No, and no inconsistency. No, sir. No, no contradiction. That's correct, yes, sir. Now, I'm not going to have you get that map out, but we're generally familiar with all the, the not that many streets in Satilla Shores. No. And you can enter that subdivision off of Highway 17 in at least maybe only two ways. One is Zellwood Drive and one is Satilla Drive, right? Yes, that's correct. So when you enter off uh, Zellwood from <coughs> Highway 17 and you can come up to the intersection of Satilla Drive, you can turn right on Satilla and go down past where the English house is, where the McMichael house is and all of that, right? If you, you want to look at the map? Well, if you come off Zellwood, you would turn down Holmes, or there's another street that you could turn down. Well, Zellwood, one end of Zellwood terminates right there at Highway 17. Do you have a map? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. See where I'm Yes, sir. If you come down Zellwood to go to Larry English's house, you would have to turn down a side street and then get to Satilla. Okay. You, you, yeah, if you follow what I'm saying, sir. But, but that little side street, does it have a name? Uh, yes, you could turn down Holmes or you can turn down Jones Road. Okay, but before you get to Jones or Holmes Road, wouldn't you cross Satilla Drive on Zellwood? Oh, that's what you're saying. Yes, yes, sir. You could you could come off that road and go with it. Yes, so we're, we're tracking. We're tracking. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I thought you meant going on further down. No, what, what I'm trying to get at is this: you can say you're coming down 17. You can turn right. That would be if you were heading southeast on 17. You could turn right on the Zellwood, come up to Satilla, turn right on Satilla, and then you'd be headed down toward the English House, the McMichael House, and. You all, could, yes. All the streets where all this happened. You could, yeah. Or you could keep going down 17 and you could just turn right on Satilla Drive and then go on into the subdivision that way, right? I believe so, sir. Okay. I think you might have lost me a little bit here in that. Well, here's what I'm going to get at with that set of questions. All the streets we're talking about, Zellwoods, Satilla, Jones Road, Holmes Road, there's Burford. Mm -hmm. Those are all the streets and issues here. Yes. Um, have you been around, you and you and all your law enforcement agents, been around to knock on every door on all those streets to ask the residents if they saw anything or if they have surveillance cameras in their homes pointed at the street? Yes, sir, I believe so. We did a thorough neighborhood canvas of Satilla Shores as well as the area where Mr. Aubrey lives, as well as the next subdivision over, um, yes. asking the same questions. All right, good deal. Sticking just with Satilla Shores, though, are you saying that you and your agents in this canvassing have indeed gone to every house in there on these streets that we're talking about? I believe so, sir. I'd have to check the map that we did, because uh, we did a thorough canvas of that. And the, the mission of the canvas was what I just said, to ask residents did you see or hear anything, and do you have surveillance cameras, and can we look at them? And if you've seen a Mott Aubrey running in the neighborhood. And, and mm -hmm. have you seen a Mott Aubrey running in your neighborhood? Yes. All right. Did you find anyone in that canvassing who said, yeah, I saw something relevant to the day in question, February 23rd? Other than the people we've already talked, talked about. about. Thank you. Um, not any that saw the event occur. Um, I do not believe so. We asked about surveillance video. Um, there was none other that we gathered from those inquiries involving the surveillance video of the area. Like I said, we did uncover people that saw Maude Aubrey running in the neighborhood in the past. Okay, so nobody saw or heard anything other mm -hmm. than the people we've talked about? Uh, of, the, of the actual incident, yes, right. I believe. And well, that heard what we did find people that heard the gunshots. Yes. Sir. Okay. Yes. Sir. Right. Fair enough. Tell me about the collection of any surveillance video. Um, how many surveillance videos from homes in the neighborhood do you have? I 
of the neighborhood. One, two, three. I believe four to five, but I'd have to check um, of what we have that we could stitch together the path. Okay. And have you begun the process of taking those four or five Gideos and trying to make one whole? We have. Yes, sir. That, that's been accomplished with the exception of Mr. Bryan's video has to be incorporated in it. So and we didn't get this those four or five, there's Bryant's, there's who? Diego Perez? No, sir. I don't think no. we, we, they, no, sir. We got video from Mr. English's house, from um, the gentleman across the street from Mr. English's house, from Mr. Bryant's house. There's at least one other uh, surveillance video that's along the path. Do you know which street that one is? Not, not without referring to it. That's something that Glen County PD had obtained the day this occurred. Um, and there may be one other, I'm not sure, among the same, that would show just running. So the, the, the others that you can't remember whose they are, they just show a lot already running? Yes, they're at the time of the incident, yes. Do you know if any of those that show Maude Aubrey just running are on Zellwood Drive or Satilla Drive at any point off of Highway 17 and before he would have arrived at the English house? Follow my question? Yes, sir. Um, no, it would be um, the video that first picked him up on Satilla Drive was the neighbor across the street. And as I testified earlier, you see him come into frame prior to arriving at the English house, and I can't estimate how far it is, and you see him going into the English's house. I know the one you're talking about. Okay. I'm, I'm tracking with you there. But just to make sure we nail it down, you haven't found any surveillance video prior to that one at that, that point? That's correct. Sir. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask this, you know, I'm doubting you have this, but I've actually been in a case with the GBI before where this was discussed. Have you attempted to or think it's possible to find satellite video that would have captured the scene that day? I have not made that attempt nor considered that to be a possibility. You thinking about it now? You brought it up, sir, so I'm sure I'll be exploring it. Let us know if you find anything. Okay. That's all I have. All right. Do you have any other questions here? I have a few questions. No, I would note that I appreciate the court's patience today. Because uh, we all started about 8.30, from the perspective of Mr. Ryan, his defense starts at 3.08 p.m. Sir, my first, can you see me, Mr. Dodd? I, I reckon you can't see me. I cannot see you, Mr. Goff. Um, yeah, I'm going to move over to, the, to the, the, the part over there by the table, I guess. Um, yeah, I got to watch that. <sighs> Mr. Dodd, I think you had more hair the last time we were in this courtroom. I probably did, Mr. Goff. I agree with you. Fair enough. Sir, I'm going to try not to ask too many questions. My first question is this. Mm -hmm. Is there any evidence of racial animus on the part of Roddy Bryan against Mr. Arbery? Specifically against Mr. Arbery or in general? That's the first question, specifically against Mr. Arbery. I've seen no communications involving that with in, refer in regards to Mr. Arbery, no, sir. Very good. Is there, is your investigation uncovered any evidence that race played a role in the actions of Roddy Ryan on 2-23-20? Mr. Goff, I'm trying to answer your question as thoroughly as I can. Revealed, as far as my opinion of motivation and reasons behind actions. Well, I'll take your opinion first. Yes, sir, it did. You believe it did? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, following up on your opinion, uh, is there any evidence that race played a role in the actions of Roddy Bryan on 223-20? There is evidence that of Roddy Bryan's 
racist attitude in his communications. Okay. And from that, I extrapolate the reason why he made assumptions he did that day of what was occurring. He saw a man running down the road with a truck following him, and I believe he made certain assumptions that were at least in part based upon his racial bias. All right. You're familiar with the concept of the implicit bias? I'm not an attorney, sir. Oh. All right. Let me be more specific. Uh, did your investigation uncover any trash talk uh, on social media by Mr. Brian against Mr. Arbor or his family or anybody else? No, sir. Okay. And, and we'll get into some of those details later, but it's fair to say that, that Mr. Brian gave you access to approximately five years worth of posts on social media. Uh, yes, sir. He, gave, he was cooperative and gave us access to right. everything. So we don't have a, 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 any racist talk on there, do we? Not in social media. There was on his phone communication. On his phone? Okay. Yes, uh, and, of course, he gave you consent to search his phone, did he not? He did, yes, sir. Twice? On May 11th and May 13th? I believe so. I think there was some issue with getting access to the phone, I believe. But I, I was not involved in the download of the phone. Again, technology is not, I'm not the most conversant in that. And I had another agent that was assisting with that. Okay. So. Well, he was very cooperative in providing the phone. Yes. Well, we may disagree about the law here, but on the, on the facts, we seem to largely be in agreement, as I yes. if I'm judging it correctly. Um, did you find then something on his phone that you found troubling with respect to whether this case involves racial animals? I did. Yes, sir. Can you tell us what that is? There were various comments that Mr. Bryan made concerning um, race using racial derogative terms, statements that he made in reference to, I think he was at an airport and he said it's great, there's not as many, and he used a racial term um, up here. Um, stuff that I felt showed his viewpoint and bias that I believe, based upon my opinion, played a role in how he interpreted what he saw that day and the actions he took. But well, we can agree that people's life experiences do affect how they see things. Absolutely, yes, sir. All right. Um, and, and is it fair to say that there were several thousand Facebook posts over that five-year period? I believe there was a lot, yes, sir. I, like I said, I okay. didn't count them, but there, there was a lot of posts, a lot of information. And thousands of texts on this telephone. There was a lot of information, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and how many of these um, suspect or questionable communications did you identify? Well, again, I've had Intel Angelus trying to keep track of it. I am personally aware of several. I can't give you a number. Um, so this fairly, we're talking about several texts out of several thousand. Yes, sir, but I don't have a complete number of how many are going to be involved in racial talk. I was made aware of several that I personally found very disturbing concerning the references that were made um, as far as a total number of texts, I, mean, I do not have a number for that. Oh. Of course, those communications are also not, however regrettable and unfortunate, not all that uncommon in the South, are they? I, I will tell you, sir, there were terms that he used that I've never encountered before in my experience for racial term he used. Um, so. I, as far as the generality of racial comments, I, I don't know, Mr. Goff. I suspect there are people in this courtroom who can educate you about a whole lot of inappropriate terms. That's a conversation for a different day. Uh, my question, next question for you is this. Uh, the Glynn County Police Department uh, received consent from Mr. Ryan, did they not, to fingerprint the vehicle? They did, yes, sir. And in fact, they did that. They did, yes, sir. Took photographs, all nine yards. Yes, sir, they did. Have we determined whether Mr. Arbery's fingerprints are in fact on Mr. Bryan's vehicle? The fingerprints have been submitted to our lab. Um, however, I do believe, based upon the Glen County report they did of the analysis of the prints they lifted, that it's going to be a palm print. Um, we have been unable to locate any palm prints for Mr. Arbery, but I have sent, because um, Mr. Um, Bryan and uh, and then the individual who had access to the truck has provided palm prints, so we've sent those up with the fingerprints to rule them out as the possible contributors to palm print. Is that very good? And that's right. Mr. Um, Brian and his fiance 
uh, yes. consented and gave you uh, their finger and palm prints, did they not? They did, yes, sir. All right. Um, where was Mr. Arbery's motor vehicle located at the time of the shooting? At the exact time of the shooting, I do not know, sir. Um, we have spoken to neighbors who indicated that he routinely kept the motor vehicle at the front yard of his residence, that it would often, I mean, he would run so he wouldn't drive it very often, and it would be, the battery would go dead, and he would borrow jumper cables, jump it off, and let it run for a little bit, but apparently he was very much in the practice of running to different locations versus driving the car. Okay. Well, eventually you did locate the motor vehicle, did you not? I don't know if one of my agents have laid eyes on the motor vehicle or not. I don't know, sir. Well, certainly there's no evidence that Mr. Arbery had a whole bunch of other people's things in his car, right? Oh, no, as far as I know. Mean, yes. You found no evidence. That's right. That's right. Okay. Very good. You have seen the full video uh, that was provided by Mr. Ryan to the Wynn County Police Department on I, February 23rd? I have, yes, sir. All right. Um, both in that video and the one that was released by someone other than Mr. Bryan. Yes, sir. Um, there appears that Mr. Arbery dropped something uh, along the way prior to being shot. Um, have you located that item? Um, there was discussion about dropping something. I didn't see him drop anything. Um, I had an agent look and there was a um, stick, I believe, that he identified as what people were alleging was a hammer or something along those lines. Okay. Um, my agent reviewed the video. It's um, he says what they're identifying as a hammer is not, um, and that was his analysis of it. Okay, but they did they did on the video they did confirm that he was carrying what looked to be a stick. That I do not know. I know there was discussion of it being a hammer that's on the road. They're saying drop, and my agent said no. That is a stick that's on the road. Well, we know there's a lot of information that. Facts out there, supposedly, that we all know aren't really true. That's correct, sir. Uh, so there's no hammer? No, sir. All right. Did, did we see some place in the evidence a stick on the side of the road? No, sir. Uh, then I take it we don't have any fingerprints of, of this stick? No, sir. Very good. Uh, there were some questions earlier about the autopsy in this case. Have you read the autopsy? I have, yes, sir. Oh. And did you read it prior to taking the warrants on... May 8th and May 21st? I did, yes. <coughs> May 7th, I believe. May 7th, I'm sorry. Are there any wounds, markings, or other observations or conclusions in the autopsy report that would be relevant to the prosecution of Mr. Bryant? Other than what I've already described as far as the wound placement? Uh, we're not, I'm not going to go over the gunshot wounds. That's already been covered. Is there anything else of value to this court or any court in, in, this, in this autopsy? Not that I can roll call at this point, Mr. Roll. Okay. Are there any videos of the shooting of Ahmaud Arbery uh, from any other angles other than the one from which uh, Mr. Bryan took his video? The only one I have seen is the one from Mr. Bryan. There are allegedly another vid uh, video. We have a witness who said that she had observed a video on Greg McMichael's cell phone that was from a different perspective, um, but we have not been able to substantiate that. Do we know who this witness is? We do, yes. She's been interviewed, and she gave us that statement, but she was not sure that, she didn't think it was from the same angle as the one that Mr. Bryan provided, but she was not 100% sure of that, but she didn't think so. Um, which was one of the reasons why we <coughs> saw a search warrant to search Mr. McMichael's phone to find out if the video he has on his phone that she saw is the one that he obtained from Mr. Bryan. Um, Are there security or safety reasons why you don't feel comfortable disclosing this uh, person's name? No, I can't remember her name off the top of my head. I Fair enough. Know. Fair enough. Okay. Um, Are there any other eyewitnesses to the shooting besides Mr. Bryan? Uh, this is Greg McMichael, who would be the only other eyewitness, and Travis McMichael that I'm aware of. Okay. So is there any evidence that Roddy Bryan was armed during the events of February 23rd? Mr. Bryan, yeah. no, no evidence of that, but he was allowed to leave the scene, I believe, before 
Fair enough. Yes. But you, you are aware, uh, at least generally, of the polygraph results uh, for Mr. Bryant. I'm aware that a private polygraph was given, but I personally don't put a lot of weight in those counsel. Well, I, I, I understand that. Uh, but that polygraph examination indicated that uh, Mr. Bryant was unarmed. Uh, at the time, do you have any evidence to the contrary at this point in your investigation? Judge, I'm going to object to that. It's not relevant in polygraph. Um, Tests are not admissible under Georgia law, absent certain conditions. And I haven't tendered them. But I, I, I'm trying to verify with the GBI that they were able to verify that those, that those results are consistent with their investigation. You can ask the question. I know nothing that would refute the statement that he was unarmed, that I have been able to collect so far in this investigation. Uh, and is your investigation consistent with the polygraph results to the extent that there's no evidence that Mr. Bryan was in communication either with McMichaels or anyone else prior to the shooting that day uh, about anything going on in the neighborhood? Prior to the shooting, I do not have any evidence that would refute that. That's correct at this point. Now, going back in time, Mr. Bryan uh, submitted voluntarily to an interview with the Glynn County Police Department at the scene of the shooting on February 23rd, did he not? He did, yes, sir. And he invited uh, was it Officer Minshew to come, yes. it was Officer Minshew, to come sit in his car and look at the video in his car. Yes, sir, that's correct. And, and there's been some question about the number of videos. Uh, the first video in this case that was released to the public, uh, that is a video that was actually prepared or produced by the Glynn County Police Department themselves. It was, yes, sir. Officer Minshew, and it's reflected on his body cam, attempts to cut the video down to what he figured was the relevant portion so that he could transmit the video from the phone to a place, I'm assuming email it or text it, to a place where they could gain access to it. I believe he was unsuccessful, which is the reason why, uh, or one of the reasons why a download was requested and granted uh, by Mr. Bryan of the phone to extract the full video. But it captured both videos because it had already been created. But this is a, a case where we're questioning at this point the authenticity of, of the video made by Mr. Bryan. Are we? No, sir. I am not. There's no evidence that Mr. Bryan has edited or altered any videos in this case. Not that I'm aware of. After speaking with the police uh, at the scene of the crime, Mr. Bryan voluntarily goes to the Lincoln County Police Department and interviewed again. Yes, sir. That's correct. Uh, and you've given a lot of testimony today. Uh, basically, there's a statement on the scene to Officer Minch. There's a statement to the County Police Department. Now, there's two subsequent statements on May 11th and May 13th with Agent Jason Seacrest yes. uh, at your temporary operational headquarters or whatever? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, the first statement to the Glen, the two statements to the Glen County Police and the two statements to the GBI, are they all basically consistent? Yes, sir. I would agree with that. They're basically consistent. Yeah, there's no question in this case as to whether Mr. Bryant has ever lied uh, or attempted to deceive your agency or any other about this matter. I've got no evidence that he has lied. Then I'm going to save you going through each statement, all that stuff. We've been here a long time. But basically, uh, Mr. Bryant has fully cooperated with your investigation. He has, yes, sir. Is there anything that he's requested, anything that's been asked of him that he's been unwilling to do? Not that I'm aware of, no sir. Who was it that alerted the GBI to the existence of the security camera at his house? He did. Okay. And who was it that invited you all to his house? He did. Okay. Uh, and when the Glen County Police Department interviewed Roddy Bryan on uh, February 23rd, did they ask him what was said after the shooting? No, sir. They did not. Not that I recall. Did you all ask? Or did Mr. Bryan bring that to your attention on May 13th? I believe Mr. Brown brought it to our attention. Yeah. But for Mr. Brown's cooperation, there's a good likelihood evidence would have been lost or not discovered in this case. I don't know about that, Councilman. Okay. Very good. Um, let's talk about the um, motor vehicle. Mr. Brown gave consent to the Boone County Police Department the day of the shooting to fingerprint and examine the vehicle, correct? He did, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and 
Of course, he gave consent. I'm, I'm sorry, back up. He gave consent for y'all to search his car, his house, everything he wanted for firearms, and you've done that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, on the motor vehicle, did you ask to search the event data recorder on this motor vehicle? I did, yes, sir. And what does that do? That's the computer system within the vehicle. It would log different information in reference to the vehicle. Um, it's the computer brain of the, of the vehicle. It can log all sorts of information. And we can gain access to that and possibly gain relevant data concerning speed, direction of travel, uh, Bluetooth devices that are hooked up to um, the radio into the thing. All sorts of information can be obtained from it. And we were able to obtain that information in this case from Mr. Brian B. We were, yes, sir. And, and that's turned out to be important in your investigation? Um, there was what I consider to be relevant data on that, yes, sir. Well, uh, were you present? I, don't, I, I can't recall. Were you present for the reenactment? No, sir, I was Mr. not. Mr. Brian? No, sir, I was not. Uh, was there some difficulty ascertaining the path of travel for Mr. Brian uh, when you were conducting your investigation? For us, yes, sir. We were attempting to piece together the various statements and of where people were and how the travel, which is what I outlined earlier, we were at, and so we were having difficulty doing that. And with the map, you did your best, but even for a trained police officer, it is hard to articulate the chaos of that day. Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay. And is chaos a fair description of what was going on out there that day? One vehicle's going one way, another vehicle's going the other way, they're not in communication with one another? I, I would say, I, I don't know if I would use chaos, pursuit, hunt, something along those lines. Those were the words you would use. That's the words I would use, yes, sir. Okay. We'll come back to that. Mr. Bryan advised y'all, did he not, that he believed that he was traveling at no more than 10 to 15 miles an hour uh, when the video that was released to the public, uh, that speed his vehicle was moving at the time? I believe so, sir. I don't know if he got that specific with the miles, but I was told that, um, in my understanding, was he indicated that he was moving at a slow rate of speed. The, vehicle made, the video makes it look like the vehicle is moving at a higher rate of speed than it, than it was. I believe so, yes, sir. And, and that's one of the things the event data reporter is going to help verify. It could. I don't think it's going to help in this particular instance. Uh, and the total distance of the trip that Mr. Bryan made that day, in actuality, appears to be much shorter than, than it might appear, just looking at the map. Um, yes, sir. I, I would guess so. I, if I understand your question correctly, the, the map may look further than when you actually drive it. It doesn't seem as far. That's what's after asking. Listening to someone describe it, it sounds like Mr. Brian's vehicle went a lot further than it really did that day. I don't, I don't. Okay. Well, I, we're going to try to take this from a different perspective. Okay. I'm not going to play with maps. I'm no good with them. Okay. okay. But with the court's permission, I will borrow the easel. It is kind of helpful. And I'm going to try not to trip over anything on my way back through the jury box. I hope that wasn't anybody laughing. Now, if you need to take this in your hands, that's perfectly fine. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give you this mark, okay? Okay. Here, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I can't see and make it out on the monitor. Can I reposition so I can yeah. better see? Thank you. And is there any suggestions 
as to the better way to set this up, I'm all ears. No, no sir. All right. However you choose to do it is fine by me. Right. Officer Dial, I'm showing you what's basically a, a blank piece of poster board with a long line across it and timeline written at the top. Okay, sir. The goal is on my left and your right, put the time of the shooting. On my right and your left, put the time that Mr. Arbery goes into the house, the English residence. Okay. Uh, you are familiar, and I'm going to leave this with you, and I'm going to step back out without trying not to injure myself or anybody else. Madam Court Reporter, you can still hear me? You, are, you have looked at the New York Times uh, recreation uh, that's uh, some guy named Malachi. Yeah, I'll be the briefly. Dude. Yes, um, I'll be the briefly. We, we all know he didn't get it exactly right, but uh, he, he begins with the video from inside the English residence or the video across the street mm -hmm. where Mr. Arbery walks up to the, uh, walks up, jogs up, we'll just leave that for another yeah. day, comes up in, into the house. Mm -hmm. And that video, uh, purports to be at 12.46 p.m. Now, there's some question as to whether that's accurate or not. That, that, yes, sir, I don't believe that that's okay. an accurate time. Your recollection is what time does Mr. Arbery walk up to the house? Well, the problem is finding a consistent time here. Um, so, the best indication I have in this investigation of a consistent timeline that we can establish is utilizing the 911 call data. That's one clock. And what we have is at 108, um, a call was made by um, Mr. Albanez that Mr. Aubrey is inside the residence. I'm sorry, sir. Tony would prefer that his, his mother would prefer to call him by Albanese. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't take it personally. Okay. But, okay. Yeah. But um, that's at 108. So while there's, you can look at video other video of the time, it can be off by several minutes, which sometimes is not a matter of concern, but when you're dealing with this time frame, um, to be more exact, to use one, I guess, clock, and the best one to do is the 911 center. So at 108, the call comes in that Mr. Um, Aubrey is inside the residence. Right. But you have the English video. Yeah. I do, yes. And you can look at the timestamp on the video when Mr. Arbery goes in the residence, the length that he's in there, and the time that he comes out, and you compare that to the time on the 911 call. In fact, Mr. Arbery was there since about 104 <clears throat> at the house. Yes, sir, but like I said, again, though, you're talking about looking at the time on the video as it compares to the 911 call time. I understand. But the incident, and we could argue the, 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 the niceties of it, but yes. Mr. Arbery goes into the house, uh, and the evidence would suggest around 104 p.m. Okay. Sir. Okay. Well, if you'll go right 104 on the left, on your left, uh, at the beginning of the timeline. Okay. All right. And then the 911 call is at 108. Yes. Oh, sir. oh, oh I, I, I got ahead of myself. The shooting, as best you can determine, takes place at 116, 118, 115. 115. Again, the Lincoln County Police Department arrives at 116? Yes, sir. All right. So we believe the shooting took place at 115. Greg, that's when Greg Michael was on the phone with 911, and that is approximately um, when it picks up, then you hear him making the statement. So the shooting happened within a few seconds of him right. on the 911. So on the right-hand side, put 115. <laughs> Now, the New York Times, which is certainly not evidence, uh, but their investigation suggests that the incident is 12 minutes in length. We're going to go with 11 minutes here, correct? Okay, sir. All right. Now, the, the full video that Mr. Bryan provided to the Glen County Police Department, and, and by the way, y'all sees this only copy. You took his cell phone for the third time in a week, right? Yeah. Uh, I won't ask you when we're going to see that phone again, but putting that aside for now, the full video is seconds? I believe that's right, yes sir. All right, can you can you move two bits uh, estimated as best you can there, come back to 
where the, Mr. Bryan's video begins. Understanding this is not a trick, it's not yeah, science. Yeah, I know. Science. I, I'm not very good at estimating like that. <laughs> you said it was two minutes and 30 seconds, I believe. I believe it's two minutes and 30 seconds. Maybe if you want to double check your record, maybe it's two minutes 40. Somebody, uh, somebody may have a better idea of that. No, I think you're approximately correct, Counselor. So, okay, well. All right. So, somewhere between 112 and 113 is when the video goes on. Am I correct? Yes, sir. That'd be, I, I think that's correct. And, and, you know, without spoiling the suspense for, for the American people, it's fair to say a good bit of the video that hasn't been released is a picture of the floorboard of Mr. Bryan's motor vehicle. Am I correct? That's correct, yes, sir. Okay. Um, but to be fair, that video doesn't turn on at the beginning of this county. This, Mr. Bryan's role in this begins when he's sitting, uh, working on his front porch. Am I correct? That's correct, yes. And that was his statement to y'all. Yes, sir. And to Glen County PD. Yes, sir. He was working on his porch, repairing the uh, doing some woodwork on the porch. I, I don't recall you know, what, okay. what his. Uh, and he indicated that he was playing the radio at the time. I don't recall that. I, okay. I don't recall that. And I believe he indicated in his interview with y'all that he was somewhat hearing impaired due to too many years of listening to loud music. That sounds correct. That sounds correct. All right. Now. You may not know the exact location, but is it fair to say that the distance between the English residents and the Bryan residents is considerable? Yes, sir. I, I mean, I would depends on how you would term considerable. Okay. Um, I would not term it as close. No, sir. Okay. There's certainly no issue that he could have heard or seen what was going on down at the English residence. Yeah, that's correct. Yes, sir. There's no way. Okay. Um, Based on the recreation of his path of travel by Officer Seacrest and the other agents on May 13th, which I believe, that was video recorded, was it not? It was, yes, sir. And I'm sure there's reasons why you don't want to share that today. That's a conversation for a different day. But, well, if you do, be sure we can set the equipment up, but I don't think we really want to go there today, do we? Okay. Most of Mr. Ryan's role is in this case, it starts from his security camera video. Have we been able to identify the timestamp, the reliability of the timestamp on his home security system? Um, I have not, sir. Like I said, the home security system is with my technology people that are going to do an analysis of it go through that. So I'm hoping that's information I'll be able to obtain from them, but I do not have it as of yet. Based on the video reenactment that was done with the GBI mm -hmm. and all the previous statements, the time frame for Mr. Bryan's involvement from when Mr. Arbery and the McMichaels go by his residence to the video camera turns on. Maybe a minute. I'm not certain of that, Councilman. Okay. Certainly no more than two minutes. From the time when From the, the time they go by his house until then the he's video pulling out. Comes on. Okay. The video the, the home video. Yes, sir. Oh, whoa. I, yes, sir. I don't know about that. I don't know how long it would be from the time that. Okay. Um, he's in front of their house until he well, starts his I, I put it video. in a different way. Based on the recreation, how many feet did Mr. Bryan's car travel from the moment he pulled out uh, of his driveway to when the video camera comes on? That I don't know, sir. I believe he's on. The, ba the camera happens when he's on Holmes Road, when he turns it on. So, all right. So, let me, let me, one moment. Yeah, I don't quite see the point of all this, cancer, so let's get rid of it. When we look at the time frame involved, Officer Dial, isn't it fair to say that Ronnie Bryan's involvement is at most the last one-third of this incident, maybe less than one-quarter? The vast majority of the activity in this case precedes his involvement in it. I would say the last half of it, Counselor. I don't know if I would go as far as to say the last third of it. It's a conversation perhaps for a different day. But he's missed, Mr. Bryan's missed at least half of the action. In no disrespect to, to Mr. Arbery, half of the, the activity, half of the events, he's missed half of that I before that they would, go by his house. I think that would be fair, yes, Counselor. And there's no way he could possibly know what's actually happened. No, no I, yes, sir, I, I think that's correct. Now, 
In your um, testimony, you indicated that Mr. Bryan made several attempts, and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but several somewhat ambiguous, several attempts to block Mr. Arbery's path or change his direction. Yes, sir, okay. that's correct. The first of those occurs when he pulls out of his driveway, am I correct? That's correct, yes. Sir. Now, you've watched the video yourself, have you not? Um, the reenactment video prepared by Agent Secret. I've seen parts right? of it. I don't know if I've seen the entire okay. of the video. Well, you've been out to, to Mr. Bryant's house, have you not? I have, yes, sir. And there's a tree and a big bunch of bushes there on, yes, the, on the left as you pull out of his driveway. Yes, sir. Okay. So when we say that Mr. Bryant was trying to block Mr. Arbery, uh, did Mr. Bryant not tell you, and isn't that consistent with your observation, that his view down the street of the McMichaels truck and Mr. Arbery was very limited? Yes, sir. My understanding was his intention was to turn left, but then as he pulled out, he saw Mr. Arbery, so he pulled in to try to block him at that time. Well, so when he, I mean, if your question is when he came up with the mental decision, the plan to block him, um, I believe that was when he was intending to turn left, saw him, and then decided to try to block him in. So he didn't turn fully left. He turned partially well, left. Well, I don't even know if he actually made the turn. He didn't get that specific in the interviews that I'm aware of. Um, he just indicated that he was pulling out, okay. saw them. That's my understanding, counsel. Well, we're, we're not going to quote a load of those details today. He pulls out in the street, and Mr. Arbery uh, runs to the, the drainage area that's to the side of the street. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that is the first time that you contend that Mr. Bryan tried to block the path of travel of Mr. Arbery. I believe that was what... Um, I believe that was the statement that was given. Yes, sir. That, that, your investigation, that's what you, that's what you believe? Yes, sir. Okay. What's the second time that Mr. Arbery tries to block the path of Mr. Arbery? Mr. Bryan indicates that he tried several times to block him in in his statement that he gave to the Gun County PD on the day that this occurred, that there were multiple instances that he tried to block him in. Um, it's also referenced at the time on Holmes Road um, that he tried to block him in as well. Okay, well, I'm, I'm trying to go through them one at a time. We've discussed where he pulls out into in the, in the street, and Mr. Arbery actually turns out to be right there. We've discussed that. Mm -hmm. What is the next time? I understand from the Glen County, the statement given to the Glen County Police Department, it's very difficult to, to get into some of those details. Am I correct? Uh, yes, sir. They, they didn't, you're asking me to parse out exactly the location of where he made this move, whatever, that was not covered in the Glen County Police Department interview. It was just his statement that he tried multiple times to try to block him in, to, um, you know, stop him, detain him, how, whatever phrasing you would like to use okay. in reference to that. Well, Mr. Ryan never used the word detain, did he? He did not, no, sir. He said stop, uh, stop block, him, block st stuff like that. Um, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, which to so, me means detain. Well, the, we may disagree about the legal consequences of, of the facts, but that's neither here nor there at the moment. But when Mr. Bryan came to see y'all on May 11th, of course, that conversation was to fill y'all in on events since he had left the Glen County Police Station on February 23rd. That was the, that, the, those were the parameters of, of the interview. That was the parameters of the interview, yes, sir. But that. By mutual agreement. Yes. Okay. So y'all didn't have an opportunity that day That's to correct. get back into the end of events of February 23rd. That's correct, sir. I think that was the agreement that that they would not explore that part on that day. Okay. But then on May 13th, after the polygraph results came back and referred to the GBI, Mr. Brown agreed to answer all of the questions. Yes, sir. I believe so. But there was some issue as to Mr. Brown's ability to articulate the path of travel, which had been your concern? Um, I don't know if there was problems with him articulating. There may be problems with us having a good understanding of okay. what he was trying to relay. And I don't know where the fault was, but the, I think the decision was made to videotape and have him drive back to help us get an idea of path of travel. Yes. So when he goes back to Satilla Shores with the agents, and takes them back through to this video reenactment uh, of his path of travel. At that point, y'all have information you can answer more specifically. What's the second time 
that Mr. Bryan attempts to change or block the path of Mr. Arbery's travel. Counselor, I don't know if they went into those kind of details. That was not imparted to me of the exact location of where he tried to block them in. Like I said, um, my understanding and my review of the interview Glenn County did on the day that this occurred, he admitted to making multiple attempts. Now you're asking me where these occurred at. I do not know if those were covered during the recreation or not. Okay. Uh, Agent Dial, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. There's 40 gigabytes of evidence in this case. I mean, yeah. no one wants to be in your shoes. Yes, sir. Okay? I understand. But to be fair, you actually haven't watched the video reenactment that Mr. Bryan spent the afternoon working with your agents on. No, sir. I've, wa I've watched some of it, but not the entirety like I testified to earlier. Okay. So your testimony that Mr. Bryan attempted to block or change the travel of Mr. Arbery several times is based solely on the Glenn County Police Department interview. No, sir. The agent that did the interview with um, Agent Secret yes. reported back to me yes. the salient details of his interview with Mr. Bryan. That's how that works in an investigation. The agents do interviews and they report back to the case agent whichever, you know, what salient information they obtained. Later on, they then prepare a report. Later on, when I get the report, that's when it's reviewed and gone through. Okay. That's how the process of an investigation goes. And we all know Officer Seacrest is a very capable uh, agent. Very much so, yes. But for the sake of the judge, he's trying to ascertain whether there's probable cause to support the arrest warrant that alleges uh, control the direction and detention, confine and detention. We've talked about the one incident when Mr. Bryan pulls out of the driveway. Mm -hmm and finds Mr. Arbery is not down the street being chased by the B. Michaels. He's coming back right in front of him, literally. We've discussed that, okay? Yes, he pulls out and tries to block him according to his statement. Okay. What is the next time he, on this timeline? When is the next time that Mr. Bryan attempts to do that, and how does he do that, or are you in a position to say today? I am. He made several attempts with his vehicle to try to block in to... Um, walk in Mr. Aubrey as he was going down the street from his residence to the intersection with Holmes Road there. I mean, you said that. What I'm asking you, and if I'm not, if I'm not saying correctly, feel okay. free to help me understand the confusion. You said that happened several times. We've discussed the first time. Yes, sir. Several usually means two or more. I, Tell me the details, if you have them, for the benefit of the judge. Tell me the details about the second time, the next time that Mr. Bryan attempted to block the, the path or direction of travel of Mr. Arbor. I am repeating his words of what he said he did. He did not in, say um, specifically, and this time I did that, he made the statement that several times he attempted to use his vehicle to block in Mr. Aubrey. He delineated the first time it happened. Then he said several times. That also is confirmed with Greg McMichael's statement, which indicates that... Um, Mr. Um, Brian was trying to block in Mr. Aubrey. Well, that, that, that's, that's good. But what I'm saying is, when your agents take Mr. Brian out to Satilla Shores to, to create this video, yes, sir. and lead him through that video, what is the second incident that's on that video? Judge, I'm going to object. This has been asked repeatedly and answered. I agree. I think he's answered that question several times. He's answered it two or three times, Council, so let's move on to something else. <coughs> you testified earlier about the attempted carjacking of Mr. Bryan's vehicle. I'm going to object to the characterization of attempted carjacking. That's uh, mischaracterizing the testimony and evidence that's been presented here. Would you repeat the question? I'll rephrase. What do you call in law enforcement parlance where someone attempts to take the motor vehicle of another person while they're still in the vehicle? What do we call that in law enforcement? Judge, I object. It's not relevant. Well, for what are you talking about? For what issue is this? Yeah, I'll, I'll back up and try and come at it a different way. Okay? When Mr. Bryan spoke to the Glenn County Police Department on February 23rd, he indicated that there was a time when he felt that Mr. Ryan uh, was trying to get inside his vehicle. Mr. Aubrey. Mr. Mr. Aubrey was trying to get inside. He his felt Mr. Aubrey.
going to try to grab the door handle and open the door. Yes, sir. That's, but his statement was that Mr. Aubrey never actually grabbed the door handle nor attempted to open the door, but he felt like Mr. Aubrey was going to make that attempt. So he sped up his vehicle. Okay, well, see, this is what I'm confused about. You say he sped up his vehicle, but he sped up his vehicle in reverse. That was his statement to the GBI on May 13th, wasn't it? Okay, sir. I don't have that detail, sir. Okay. And, and when he talked to the Boone County Police Department on February 23rd, uh, his testimony then and subsequently was that he felt he made a terrible mistake because Mr. Arbery turned back towards him and he felt Mr. Arbery was going to get in his vehicle. I know he testified that he felt that Mr. Arbery was going to get into the ve in his vehicle, but I also know that he also continued to pursue Mr. Arbery after that event. And we'll come to that. But at the time that Mr. Arbery is in contact with Mr. Bryan's motor vehicle, Mr. Bryan is traveling in reverse, attempting to get away from Mr. Arbery. He can't get any closer. So do you have some evidentiary basis for the, the, the suggestion today that Mr. Bryan's vehicle was moving forward rather than in reverse when Mr. Arbery made contact with the vehicle? No, sir. All I have is Mr. Bryan's statement that he sped up the vehicle. I do not know the direction of travel of his vehicle whether he went backwards or forward when he sped up. I'm going by his statement on the day okay. of the murder. So we arrested Mr. Bryan on the assumption that his vehicle was moving forward, even though on May 13th he told Officer Jason Seacrest clearly and emphatically that he was trying to go backwards to get distance between himself. Objection, compound question, argumentative, um, relevance. You can answer the question in the rest of this. Leave that subject. I think we, yes, sir. I think we got that. No, sir. That was not the basis of my arrest, Mr. Bryan. It was his statement that he attempted to block, um, pin, however, whatever phrasing you would like to use, but detain Mr. Aubrey without legal authority, and by doing so, he contributed to Mr. Aubrey's death. And on February 23rd, when the Glen County Police Department interviewed him, and on March 13th, when the GBI interviewed him. He indicated on both occasions that Mr. Arbery, for whatever reason, looked mad, looked angry. I don't recall that, Counselor. You don't recall that? No, sir. Okay. Now, of course, if a bunch of white people that you didn't know were chasing you around, chasing you around with cars and guns, you might have reason to be mad, right? Are you talking about me or Mr. Aubrey? Any young black man in South Georgia being chased by a bunch of white guys with guns would have reason to be mad, wouldn't they? Just have a call for speculation, I mean, obviously. I'll rephrase. Yeah, please do. Mr. Bryan indicated that he felt threatened by Mr. Aubrey's actions. Am I correct? I believe he felt that Mr. Aubrey was going to try to open the door, if okay. that's your question about that part. Right. Yes, sir. But now, then again, he also then continued to pursue Mr. Aubrey, and you're going, we're basing it on Mr. Bryan's statement to that effect. Okay. Uh, and do you dispute that a reasonable man sitting in Mr. Bryan's shoes at that moment in time would have probable cause to believe that his motor vehicle was about to be stolen? Objection that would call for speculation as to what his client was thinking. Sustained. Is there any question that Mr. Arbery was authorized after, I'm sorry, let me phrase, is there any question in your mind that Mr. Bryan was himself personally authorized under Georgia law to effectuate a citizen's arrest for carjacking and for attempted theft of a motor vehicle and attempted assault and battery after the, con the, the incident with Mr. Arbery on the side of the road? Objection twofold. Uh, one, it mischaracterizes the evidence, and two, that's really a question of law and a source of argument, but not a facts question in terms of what this court must do in judging probable cause for the issuance of the arrest warrant. We'll move on, Your Honor. Thank you. today about the interview with the Glen County Police Department on February 23rd. That, nothing that's happened since February 23rd in your investigation has changed in any meaningful way 
your understanding of the case with respect to Mr. Bryan's involvement? Well, sir, I think there we've gotten more information concerning the events of that day, how they transpired, what role Mr. Bryan's actions played into that um, from what was available on February 23rd, as well as, I mean, that we've got more video evidence. There's just a more complete picture of what occurred that day. Well, certainly, uh, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation has spared no effort in uh, thoroughly investigating this case from every conceivable angle. Am I correct? We don't need your okay. comments about that investigation. Thank you, Your Honor. So, so what's the question? The question is, in terms of the probable cause to arrest Mr. Bryant, what changed between February 23rd and May 21st other than Mr. Bryant publishing the results of his polygraph results to the media? Judge, I'm going to object to the relevance of that. The, the question is the facts known at the time of the issues of the warrant, whether well, that warrant was obtained months down the road, whether it was obtained the day of, it's really not pertinent and relevant in terms of what this court must decide about the probable cause for the issuance of the arrest warrant at the time it was obtained. That's sustained the objection. What incriminating evidence as to Mr. Bryant can you point out to the court that has been developed since February 23rd? It's the same question, Judge, and I renew my objection. Sustained. redirect um, that so there's no confusion about the timeline here and investigator dial piecing better together the 911 phone calls in particular are you able to give the court an estimate of how long in total mr. Arbery was running from the people that were chasing him yes sir the best estimate again the 911 call came in at 108 um, at that point um, mr. Albanez um, the individual who <coughs> saw him going into the house is calling 911. While he's on the phone with 911 is when Mr. Aubrey comes out and runs down the road. So that's at 108. We have Greg McMichael on the phone, and he is on the phone with 911 when the shooting takes place. That's at 115. So you're talking about seven minutes is what I estimate the event uh, this occurred. Now, we also know that the first officer radio in arriving on scene at 116. So the event was done by 116. So that's my best estimate in reference to this event. We're talking minutes, though. Yes. Sir. Okay. And um, you had talked on direct exam briefly about the firing position. I'm going to focus now on Travis McMichael and what you observed on the video that Mr. Bryan took. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. I do. For the, the benefit of the court. Could you demonstrate what you saw and what that firing position looked like? If you will, um, you can even use the pointer. I believe you still have that in your pocket yes, um, to show generally what that position looked like on the video. Can I stand up, Your Honor? Yeah. While on the video, which if you focus on Travis McMichael's arms, you see the arms with a rifle, you often have your arm extended front arm, and that's what I saw. This is what I would refer to as a firing stance. This arm is extended out holding a rifle. Is that prior to any contact that you see between Mr. Physical contact between, between Mr. Arbery and, and Travis McMichael? Very much so, yes, sir. For the purpose of our record, so we're not silent for our court reporter, what you did is you stood up on the witness stand, accurate? Yes, sir. Okay, and you extended that pointer, and you held up both arms as if to, to, to aim that pointer towards me across the courtroom, correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. All right, you can take a seat, please. Um, Judge, uh, this is a, as much a point of clarification as anything else. I assume that this court has copies of the actual arrest warrants to pass upon? Yes. Okay, so you have no need for me to tender those as actual exhibits then. Is that accurate? You can tender them. I, I would like to have them in the record.
right with the court and I'm required from the defense, cut up three exhibits, just putting them together by defendant. Any objection to that? No. No objection. No objection. No objection. Just read it, please, please, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So, state one would be Travis Michael. One is technically the demonstrative aid. We're going to substitute that program. So. so just to confirm for our record, can you do states two first of all? Um, tell me what states two is a photocopy of. It's a photocopy of the state warrant in Mismas and the warrant in reference to Travis McMichael charges of, of felony murder. And there's a second page also of the state um, warrant in Mismas for Travis McMichael on the charge of aggravated assault. Uh, this is State's Exhibit 3. Confirm that that's a photocopy of the arrest warrants that you obtained for Greg McMichael. It is, yes, sir. Uh, States three is the warrant I obtained for Greg McMichael for parts of the crime of felony murder and as part of the crime of aggravated assault. And finally, States Exhibit Four, identify that protocol, please. States Exhibit Four is the front and back of the warrants I secured for William Bryan for felony murder and for a criminal attempt to commit false imprisonment. For the purpose of our record, I'll tender two through four at this time, Your Honor. Amen. And you are going to do the protocol. I'm happy to. You had um, mentioned the fact that you investigated whether there was any contact by Greg McMichael with the Glen County or Brunswick Judicial Circuit Office um, in this case, correct? That's correct, yes. Sir. And um, when was the first contact that you were able to identify where defendant Greg McMichael was attempting to contact his former employer? That would have been um, the day that the shooting occurred. Do you know where he was when he attempted that contact? Um, yes, the investigator told me believe that he was still on scene. I believe. <clears throat> on scene or at the Glen County Police Department, I believe was a statement to me. 
the, the last topic that was covered um, by defense counsel for Mr. Bryan regarding the detention was some of that um, detention or attempt to detain Ahmad Arbery, was some of that actually captured on the video that you've reviewed? Um, yes, you, are you talking about the cell phone? I am. Yes, sir. Okay. And, and describe what you could view for the last part of this leading, leading to the actual shooting itself. Um, I'm sorry, could you describe that again? You're talking about? Sure. The, did, did, did any of that video capture Mr. Bryan using his vehicle to attempt to redirect uh, Ahmad Arbery? Yes, when the video opens, his vehicle is coming forward, Mr. Arbery's running, then he comes and you hear the car turning. Um, all of that's depicted in the video. Okay. And then thereafter, I think there's been some testimony that for a period of time, the video is on the floor, or on his leg, or down, correct? That's correct, yes, sir. You can still hear the, the car gunning, though? Yes, sir. You can hear the motor moving and uh, running here in the video. And then the, the last portion of this chase, that's actually captured on the video as well? It is, yes, sir. All right. Thank you, sir. Court's permission, I just wrote down one thing, and I wanted to follow up, basically. Right. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Special Agent, we, you were asked a few questions about Mr. Arbery's vehicle. Yes, sir. That he kept in, uh, at his home there at his mother's residence. According to the neighbor that was interviewed in reference to it, yes, sir. What kind of vehicle was that? I can't recall offhand the make and model. What, what kind of car Mr. Arbery drove and jump started and I, did the battery? You don't remember what kind of car that was? I don't know, sir. I don't recall. What about other cars that were kept at the Arbery residence? Do you know what those are? I do not, no, sir. Okay. Nothing further. Thank you. Anything further? All right, you may step in. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Nothing further from the state, Your Honor. All right. Nothing further on behalf of Travis McMichael. <clears throat> Nothing on behalf of Greg McMichael. Um, Nothing further on behalf of the uh, store. As any witnesses are concerned, that's, that's correct, Your Honor. We don't have any witnesses that we intend to call. So we say that we are have finished with the hearing. That's correct, Your Honor. As far as you're concerned, what about the study? Yes, Your Honor. We have no further evidence. Uh, only argument as needed.